Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative, which honors the legacy and vital role shellfish play in supporting our environment, families, traditions, and economy. Through a partnership of government, business, academia, and community, the Shellfish Initiative will strengthen our state's shellfish management practices and promote growth and innovation in our local seafood industry. Today is a re-recording of a webinar that was uh, broadcasted last week, April 25th, 2018. Today we're re-recording from the Nature Conservancy's um, Providence, Rhode Island offices. The title of the webinar is Shellfish in the Environment, Restoration Efforts in Rhode Island. I'm Eric Schneider. I'm a biologist with DEM's Marine Fisheries Program. And I'm William Helt. I'm a coastal restoration scientist with the Nature Conservancy. We're going to trade off and on as we step through the webinar today. Let me give you an overview. We're going to start by just kind of setting the stage with commonly found um, shellfish species in Rhode Island and the ecosystem services they provide. Then we're going to move on to talking about uh, various shellfish restoration and enhancement projects, specifically a fish habitat enhancement project, a oyster restoration project, and some research that's leveraged off that work as well as another oyster restoration uh, project that's focused on enhancing harvest opportunities. Then we'll offer some conclusions and next steps. So there are a lot of shellfish commonly found in Rhode Island. Um, probably everyone who's you know, participating, listening to the webinar, you know, a specific species comes to mind when you think of Rhode Island shellfish. It might be cohogs or steamers or you know, Eastern oysters. But really, for today, we're talking about the ecosystem services provided by bivalve shellfish, and specifically, we're going to focus on Eastern oysters, the services they provide, and the work being conducted to enhance and restore their populations. So, why are Eastern oysters um, or oyster reef habitats important? Well, you know, you can tell from the slide, you know, it's ecosystem services. Then there are a number of services that they provide. Um, this is just a high level view of it. You know, they can provide shoreline stabilization. Uh, they can improve water quality, provide habitat for fish, crabs, other marine resources. Um, they can provide food um, for people and they're also help enhance cultural and community values. Um, Grabowski et al. Um, 2012 did a nice job of um, kind of summarizing a number of these services as well as providing um, insight into other literature that tried to uh, put an economic value on those services. I'm not going to go through these specifically, um, but we will touch on a couple of kind of the um, more commonly viewed services. And so the first is improved water quality by removing nitrogen. And I think that's what most folks probably think of when they think of, oh, what's the, what's the value, what's the service provided by oysters? Well, it's improved water quality. On the left-hand part of the slide, you'll see a figure depicting the nitrogen cycle. And on the right is a slide taken from an article by Humphreys et al, uh, 2016. And they did a really neat, um, project in Rhode Island um, that looked at the denitrification as well as a number of fluxes and other, other gases um, across a number of different substrates. And so what the figure that we extracted is showing um, specifically is the nitrogen removed um, at these different habitats. And you can see there is some occurring naturally on various substrate. Um, and culch alone, with no oysters, no other shellfish on it, provide some denitrification. But where you really start to make gains is when you introduce oyster aquaculture or you have a wild or restored oyster reefs. Um, and to put this in context, um, we could, one thing the authors did was um, try to evaluate how much of the nitrogen load to Ninigrit Pond in this case could be removed if 5% of the pond was covered in aquaculture or if 5% of the surface area of the pond was covered in uh, restored oyster reefs. And what their data suggested was that you could remove roughly 26% of the total nitrogen load to this pond 
if that 5% was covered with oyster aquaculture, and more than 40% of the total load if it was covered in oyster uh, reefs, whether it's wild or natural restored reefs. Um, and so you can kind of keep that in the back of your head. It might filter back through when we get towards um, the conclusions and the next steps of this talk. So another ecosystem service that reefs such as uh, the ones created by oysters provide is shoreline stabilization. As you can see in this figure, um, which was made by um, some partners at the Nature Conservancy within uh, Alabama, um, you can see in environments where there's high wave energy, you can use a reef structure such as reefs or reef balls or even bags of uh, clam and oyster shell to mitigate the waves and attenuate the waves. Uh, so you create kind of a lower energy environment behind the reef structure on, on the shore side. And so in this photo, you can see that um, the reefs are attenuating the waves and behind it, we have some um, submerged uh, vegetation as well as um, upland and intertidal vegetation that is able to propagate as a result from the lower wave action. This also allows for more um, sedimentation. So the uh, shoreline can actually accrete, accretiate accretion in um, um, uh, more sh more seaward as a result of the increased sedimentation. Um, and then it also creates more of a nursery habitat with less wave energy for juvenile uh, and, and fish seeking that nursery habitat. And we also will talk a bit about using oyster reefs to enhance fish habitat. And you might ask, well, why oyster reefs? And um, I would say it's a little bit of a two killing two birds with one stone type uh, project where we take oysters which are severely depressed not only globally but especially within Rhode Island and we're um, using them we're building the population back while also enhancing the fish habitat um, and we're targeting mainly areas that have historically provided oyster reefs or shown to have oyster reefs and there's been some previous studies that have um, shown that oyster reefs can improve growth and survival of juvenile fish, such as one by Sue Ermgassen et al., um, which looked at a, more of a meta-analysis of many oyster fish habitat enhancement um, studies, um, ranging from as no, far north as Delaware Bay, um, down the uh, Atlantic coast and into Gulf of, the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, a paper by Grabowski et al. also found that not only are the prey of juvenile fish enhanced resident invertebrates, um, but also juvenile fish abundance is uh, enhanced on oyster reefs compared to unenhanced uh, kind of bare habitat. Um, the interesting part is that these studies have so it's only gone as far north as Delaware Bay and had, it has not really been studied very well in Rhode Island. Um, and so what do we mean by fish habitat enhancement? Well, this is a photo actually taken in Potter Pond, uh, just west of Point Judith, um, where we have an oyster reef on, in, on the right that is, uh, I would say, eight to 10 years old. Um, and in the bare sediment, uh, a photo taken just off the reef um, the same day. And this is what we're trying to express when we're saying habitat enhancement. So you look on the left photo um, and you see bare, sandy, silty sediment. Um, we call this just kind of an unenhanced or largely unproductive habitat for juvenile fish. And then you look on the right um, and you see these, the oyster reefs and um, there's tons of fauna growing on the, the reefs and there's tons of structure. And so um, when you put yourself in the mind of a juvenile fish um, who is seeking food and shelter primarily, uh, one of these habitats um, is, is much more attractive. So. Um, the goal in, in these studies is to better quantify what the improvement or, is for juvenile fish. And so as Will mentioned, one of the, the real issues or concerns is that wild oyster populations are at historic lows. And this results in a significant loss of the services provided by oyster reefs. Um, you know, region, regional populations are estimated to be, you know, 15% of historic backgrounds and here in Rhode Island, um, the, the estimates vary depending on what your, what your baseline is, but we are talking at being you know, only 10 to 1% of what um, the historic populations are. And so to help combat this, there's several restoration and enhancement projects being conducted. Um, some are designed to restore and enhance oyster spawning stock and ecosystem services and provide an 
enhanced harvest opportunities um, and provide outreach and education opportunities. There's also a number of research projects being conducted. Some are aimed at evaluating techniques for enhancing habitat for fish or improving restoration techniques, and also evaluating the performance of different oyster lineages in restoration settings. And so we will go through a number of these um, over the next few sections. Um, and specifically, we'll talk about three different projects. The first one is a fish habitat enhancement project, which is a partnership between the Nature Conservancy and DEM. The next is an oyster restoration project aimed at increasing um, oyster spawning stock or biomass and ecosystem services. And this is a partnership between the uh, NRCS, DEM, and the aquaculture industry. And through this project, we're also able um, to conduct a number of research um, projects, which we'll touch briefly on, on a few of those. And the final um, project that we'll talk about is um, takes place over at Jacobs Point in the town of Warren, and that is um, that aims to try to enhance harvest opportunities. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the Fish Habitat Enhancement Project that Eric just mentioned. And so the overall goal of this project is to determine whether oyster reef construction can be used to improve growth and survival of um, the early life stages of recreationally important fishes. And we've targeted specifically black sea bass to tog, scup, summer, and winter flounder. And as I've said before, this builds upon previous work uh, done by others in the Mid-Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, but has um, not really been quite as, as well studied in Southern New England. And in order to do this, we've entered a cooperative agreement between the Nature Conservancy and DEM, and we've sought um, advice from Drs. John Grabowski and Randall Hughes from Northeastern University to help make sure that our uh, experimental designs are all sound um, and that um, they can stand up to peer-reviewed literature. Um, and to accomplish this work, we've um, secured a sport fish restoration uh, grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to help us um, complete this project. And so in order to build these reefs and evaluate them, this, the approach that we've taken is first we need to establish appropriate uh, locations for these oyster reefs. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, further down, but essentially you want to put reefs in areas where they can survive and establish. Um, and then second, we uh, submit permit applications um, to a number of agencies to allow us to do this work. Um, then third, once we receive these permit applications and we have established where we want the reefs to go, we conduct a pre-enhancement evaluation. So this is essentially to, to make sure we know what the baselines are before we come in and build these reefs. And uh, we monitor we monitor the fish populations there. And then next we actually go out and we establish the oyster reefs. And we'll show you some pictures of what um, that whole part of the project looks like. And then after the reefs are established, we continue post-enhancement evaluation um, to monitor the impacts, um, not only of the fish, but also on the oysters. And for each restoration location, we have scoped out um, this monitoring for at least three years post-enhancement. Um, though we'd love to just keep continue, continuing to monitor these reefs through time. And so the, we're in the middle of this fish habitat enhancement project. And so the status is we've, we've um, conducted baseline monitoring, constructed the reefs, and are currently post-construction monitoring within Nintegrate and Kwani ponds. Um, and I'll show what these reefs, where these reefs are located and how those designs are set up shortly. Um, and currently we're uh, going through the permitting process of Point Judith, and this summer we plan to um, establish our baseline monitoring with an anticipated reef construction date sometime in November of this year. And so within Nintegrit Pond, uh, we have what's called a BACI design, which stands for Before After Control Impact. It's a very robust design that allows you to account for a lot of variability. And so um, within Nintegrit Pond, we've established four replicates of three treatments, and each treatment is a control, an unseated reef, which is simply um, bare culch, uh, usually clam and oyster shell. Um, and then the seeded reef is we, on top of the bare culch reef, we uh, seed the reef with uh, spat on shell oysters that we received from a uh, local hatchery. Um, and the construction of this uh, was in October of 2015. And 
to zoom in a little bit more, as you can see here on the left is the, our two northern sites, and on the right we have our two southern sites. So within each uh, replicate, we have um, an individual treatment. Um, and so you can see the C, U, and S stand for control, unseated, and seated. And um, essentially what the reef construction process looks like is it's, it's a construction project. And so you can see in the top left photo, um, a pile of clamshell in the background um, and with a front loader that's about to dump the clamshell into these fish totes. And once these fish totes are filled up and uh, rigged out to be even, um, they go on our conveyor belt system with our rollers um, onto the dock and we we pull these onto the barge and then we take the barge out to our reef site and from there we place the, the shell into the water at the designated locations. Um, and then once the reef is built, this is a photo from Kwani Pond actually, um, you can see the reef in the outline. Um, Subtitling, we go out and we hand place uh, the oyster spat on shell and so what spout shell looks like you can see in the uh, lower left hand photo that's oysters that are grown out to about um, the size of a quarter um, and then they're placed on the reefs and the, the reason we grow them out we actually um, work with local aquaculturists to grow these oysters out to that size is because they can um, they're more likely to be able to withstand uh, predators at that size and so within Kwani Pond we took the experiment a step further and so within Ninigrit we were comparing um, not only the controls, but also an unseated versus seated reef. And one of the drivers there is to see if um, the fish habitat impact that you have is comparable between an unseated and seated reef. Um, essentially trying to gauge whether it's simply the structure that the fish like or are they attracted because of the oysters as well. Um, and part of that comes from oyster restoration is um, an exp spawning and setting seed on shell oysters is an expensive process. So we're considering whether you can see similar effects between unseated and seated reef. Um, within Kwani, however, um, we went to four treatments and because of the added treatment, we dropped the replicates down um, to three. Uh, we have the same control and in this one, we're comparing um, three lineages of oysters to see um, how they perform in the restoration setting, whether they provide different values um, to the system, but also to the, to the fish. And so we use the same hatchery strain that we um, use prior and then aquaculture derived hatchery strain and then we also spawn oysters from Green Hill Pond and Narrow River as our wild stocks. And we chose these because both of those systems have um, self-sustaining oyster populations so inherently there must be some genetic property to them that allows them to survive and so we took the adult oyster broodstock to Roger Williams University to spawn um, the, the seed on shell for us and th those reefs were constructed in May of 2017. So this summer we'll continue our second year post-construction monitoring. Um, and to talk a little bit more about our uh, site selection, um, it's a little bit more than just picking, you know, well, this looks like a good spot or that looks like a good spot. We actually have developed an oyster habitat suitability index um, at the Nature Conservancy, which takes into account um, uh, soils as well as salinity and depth. Um, and so you can see on the photo here, this is um, a rendering of um, the habitat suitability index for Kwani Pond. And so you can see here the darker, kind of the more orange areas are more ideal than the yellow areas for oyster restoration. Um, and on top of this, we also um, sought input and attempted to minim minimize impacts to other known public uses, whether they're um, the aquaculture leases or well-traveled areas or areas of recreation, um, even areas where people tend to commercial or recreationally cohog, we tried to avoid um, as to not step on anyone's toes basically. And so from this, we came up with two areas that seemed to be the uh, most suitable within Kwani Pond, um, one in the western basin and one in the eastern basin. Um, and so from there we established our three replicates where we have one um, on the west side of Kwani Pond and two on the eastern side um, at designated suitable locations. And so within Point Jude Pond, um, which we hope to construct in the fall, um, it's similar to the design that we had in Kwani, but we've added a fifth treatment. So we keep the same three replicates, um, the three lines, but our, our fourth line is what we're calling the polyline, and that's a combination of the three oyster lineages. And the idea there is that um, more diversity could perhaps um, allow an oyster reef to restore, um, to withstand 
um, more disturbances and, and in turn uh, thrive and propagate better in the environment compared to um, just one oyster line, lineage which had less genetic diversity. Um, and so these are the locations within northern Point Judith Pond that we selected and uh, permits pending. We hope to construct these in November uh, of this year. And so as far as the monitoring of these go, we, well, we do monitor the oysters um, and we conduct that annually, both in the spring and fall. So essentially we're trying to see, um, initially we monitor what to make sure that all three lineages um, of these oysters ha had kind of a same, the same starting position, um, but we're also tracking their growth, uh, their survival, and then their disease loads through time as well um, to see how these oysters perform in this restoration setting. Um, with the idea being that the reef with more dense, larger oysters is, is probably providing more value to this, uh, the fish. Um, we also monitor the fish, as we said, uh, before and after reef construction. We do that monthly, May through October, um, with eel pots, minnow traps, and gill nets to essentially compare between the, the um, reefs and the controls how many fish are utilizing these areas. And so with this, I'll move on. Uh, I'll let Eric take over um, and tell some more about another project um, going on in Rhode Island. Thanks, Will. So now we're moving from creating oyster reefs for the purpose of enhancing habitat for fish to creating oyster reefs for the purpose of increasing spawning stock and the services uh, that they provide. So to give you an overview, this is the NRCS EQIP. Uh, Oyster Reef Restoration Initiative. This is a voluntary program that provides financial assistance to aqu agricultural producers, in this case, they're uh, aquaculturists, to help implement conservation practices that create oyster reefs, and as I said, to improve water quality and the associated ecosystem services they provide. And really, the goal is to create sustainable oyster reefs um, in protected areas, sanctuary areas in Rhode Island waters. And so there's two phases of this project. The first phase was conducted between 2008 and 2011. And during this time, roughly 117 oyster reefs were created across seven water bodies. These are highlighted in pink on the map. Um, and until really this project focused on creating those reefs, and until recently, there was you know, really a general lack of uh, information on how these reefs were performing. You know, We knew the location, the year they were built, and the participant, um, but we didn't have any insight into um, survival or overall health of those reefs. So during 2015 and 2016, um, with funding from NRCS, we went back, um, we monitored all of these reefs, some of them twice, um, using standard methods to really get a, a sense of um, how they performed, um, how suitable some of those systems are for oysters, but also try to extract some of the um, specific reef related aspects that might have helped contribute to either the success or lack of success of a, of a given uh, reef. And we use that in what would be you know phase two or the current um, the current portion of the equip oyster restoration. Um, and so starting in 2015 this program was reinitiated. Um, and when it was brought back up online, there was some important changes from the previous work. Um, the first change is that annual monitoring has been incorporated. So every year, um, aquaculturists um, ensure that um, these reefs are, are monitored. Um, another change is that the participants are contracted for five years. Um, and so over that five years, um, they'll spend four years doing construction, and then that last year is the final year of monitoring of that, that last year of construction. Um, and we've also given a lot of thought into how we design and lay out um, these reefs. And this approach allows us to incorporate a number of different um, research projects on top of this restoration program. Um, and so just we'll dive into these a little bit deeper in a few minutes, but just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, you know, we can manipulate um, the reefs, um, the direction or orientation, the seeding density, the height, or even the genetic lineage to try to evaluate how all these factors um, relate to the performance of 
of these reefs in their environments. And so one of the really nice things about this program, I think for at least you know from the department's perspective, is it represents a true partnership um, between NRCS, DEM, and the aquaculture community. Um, really, all three of these entities um, are you know key players, and it couldn't be conducted you know without us working closely together you know in collaboration. Um, we utilize the best available science when we're trying to. Uh, make determinations as to the approach we want to use and how to move forwards. Um, we use adaptive management by assessing how these reefs are performing and making changes um, as needed. And as I said, we also incorporate research into restoration. And the figures on the right show, you know, much very similar to the techniques that are used in the fish habitat enhancement program, where we're taking shell prescribed specific amount of shell, we're loading it on barges, we're going out, we're placing it in water at specific locations, and then we're seeding that with seed on shell oysters that are grown out by aquaculturists to establish these oyster reefs. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this practice takes part over five years, and what we do is we take a 10th acre plot and we divide it into four quadrants. Um, and so over each of the first four years, um, uh, a participant works on each quadrant, and that's depicted in the top right. Um, they place roughly each year five cubic yards of shell and then five cubic yards of seed on shell. Um, and before we deploy that, um, NRCS goes out and does an assessment to make sure that we have information on the size, class, percent alive, and number of oysters that are being deployed at each um, quadrant of that plot. Um, they're also Participants are also required to ensure that these reefs are monitored. They have to um, contract a qualified um, individual um, or entity to go out and monitor these. And by qualified, there's a review process in which um, the department, in partnership with um, some of our other collaborators, uh, evaluate um, folks to make sure that they are indeed qualified to do this work so that we have consistency of data um, across these numbers of different locations. Um, we require this monitoring annually, including up to one year after they've built all their reefs. Since 2015, um, through this program, roughly 100 individual reefs have been built. And the figure in the bottom right is just a brief illustration of within this 10th acre plot, how some of those reefs might be aligned. As I mentioned, they're, they're required to be monitored. This slide um, has more details on it. Um, I'll only hit the highlights. Roughly, um, this monitoring is conducted between August and October annually, um, just like our fish habitat enhancement and like with a number of our other projects. Um, all of these projects follow the guidance contained in the Rhode Island Oyster Restoration Minimum Monitoring Metrics and Assessment Protocols. Um, so if you want more information, feel free to go there. But um, just to give you an idea of what we're doing, we're measuring the reef size, we're measuring the oyster density, the number alive, dead, the percent of algal cover, the substrate type, and the reef height. We also have pathology conducted um, to test for the prevalence and, and intensity of dermo, MSX, and SSO. And so one of the great things about this restoration project, um, just like the fish habitat enhancement work, is that we're, you know, we're using science, we're incorporating research to evaluate um, how these techniques um, are working. And so one, one great example is a project that's led by Dr. Randall Hughes of Northeastern University in collaboration with Dr. John Grabowski, also of Northeastern DEM and the aquacultures. Uh, this project, this research is funded specifically um, by a National Science Foundation grant that Dr. Hughes was awarded. And what, what Dr. Hughes is really focusing on is trying to evaluate how remote set oyster um, can be used um, in restoration environments to and evaluate the performance, survival, um, growth, and disease prevalence. And um, really what we're looking at is how different lineages of juvenile oysters, either alone or in a mixture on a reef, um, perform in these restoration settings. 
Um, and so they give you an example um, in a given year. Um, you might evaluate how three or four different uh, lineages of oysters that are commonly used in commercial aquaculture perform in a restoration setting. And, or we might evaluate how wild lineages perform either alone and then over time we can monitor the performance um, and mix and incorporate them depending on how, how well they do. Um, this also allows for potential smaller scale experiments where we can manipulate oyster source identity, diversity, density, and look at how those um, factors affect disease prevalence. There's also other research, uh, most of it's led by DEM, um, just assessing how factors um, that we can manipulate and control in our restoration process, uh, such as reef height, orientation, seeding density, affect growth survival and recruitment of oysters across our different sites. And the third project that we'll be focusing on, um, excuse me, is a collaboration between the town of Warren, Roger Williams University, and RIDEM. And the goal here is to enhance opportunities for oyster harvest by seeding a uh, portion of a shellfish management area off Jacobs Point in the town of Warren. And in addition to enhancing you know, opportunities for commercial and recreational harvest, um, we're optimistic that maybe um, we can assess the impacts of harvesting on enhanced stocks to see if this is a practice that could be, um, could be used elsewhere. And it also offers a good educational tool for school children and the general public. Um, and the way, uh, just a quick overview of how this is performed. Um, well, actually, I'll go into that in the next slide. Um, but from the management aspect, I think one thing I should mention before we leave this slide is that this shellfish management area was uh, created specifically for this practice. Um, and what we've done is we've allowed, what the we as in the department has done, is we allow for um, commercial harvest of all other shellfish species at their normal possession limit, enormous harvest rates, um, but we reduce the possession limit for oysters to one peck per person per day, regardless of the mode that you're harvesting, just to ensure that there is some, you know, a prolonged period that harvest can occur in this and that it's not um, harvested too quickly or over a short period of time that would really reduce uh, the overall number of opportunities for the general public. So to get into how this works again, um, in this case, there are oysters that are set at Roger Williams University. They're brought over to an upweller that's owned and run by the town of Warren, uh, really for the purpose of growing out oysters to be put in this uh, enhancement project. Here's a, a picture of a sign that's over at the wharf. So folks who come down to the town wharf uh, have an opportunity to get some education and information about this project. They can look at the upweller. And they, as I mentioned, they also go to schools and bring school children down to the upper weller to see how oysters are grown and talk about some of the services they provide in the environment. So to wrap things up here, in conclusion, there are a number of oyster um, collaborative and restoration um, enhancement projects in Rhode Island. Um, these are enhancing ecosystem services derived from oyster reefs. Um, and although these are successful, we, you know, we openly admit that more work is needed to better quantify the short and long-term ecological and economical, economic value that these approaches offer for Rhode Island waters. Although the current work contributes to the restoration goals identified by DEM, its partners, and in the Shellfish Management Plan, um, there's no unified plan or, or vision of statewide goals. We'll, we'll touch on that in a second under next steps. And in terms of services provided by bivalves or oysters, um, we only manage oysters right now for sustainable harvest, um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, that's really one of the uh, primary aspects of our management program. Um, but there is opportunity um, to recognize that there are, are a number of services provided by oysters that could be managed for. And some of those could be in terms of restoration goals or ecosystem targets. And for example, we could 
um, set a goal and managed to try to enhance oyster uh, populations to achieve a, let's say, 50% reduction in the nitrogen load in a given system. And so as far as the, what next steps we need to take um, and oyster restoration or shellfish restoration in Rhode Island is, I think step one is we need to continue um, to restore and enhance oyster habitat um, through our collaborative efforts. I, we found that, <coughs> sorry, collaborative efforts, um, collaborating between nonprofits and management agencies um, has really helped these projects be, get accomplished. Um, that being said, with the, or working with the Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative, um, we've begun to scope and develop a Rhode Island statewide shellfish restoration management plan. So this will allow these um, more one-off type projects to fit with into a large, into a kind of a larger umbrella and, and system and have the projects begin to complement themselves a little better. Um, we would also like to reconvene the Rhode Island Shellfish Restoration Working Group um, a collaboration of many of the experts um, within Rhode Island um, to establish these restoration goals and efforts uh, for the management plan. Uh, we'd also like to start identifying funding opportunities to support these short and long-term goals of the Shellfish Initiative um, and develop public events uh, to illustrate the importance of these restoration uh, projects and the ecosystem services provided by oysters, such as this webinar here. Um, and furthermore, we'd like to provide managers with tools to set objectives and identify their restoration goals. Um, and this is something, as I move into the next slide here, that the Nature Conservancy has been working hard on some of our partners uh, at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they just recently released a document titled Setting Objectives for Oyster Habitat Restoration Using Ecosystem Services. And part of this plan, uh, you can see the four steps on the figure to the left is, one, we need to establish values for our oyster ecosystem services. Similar to the study that Eric mentioned um, by John Grabowski, um, trying to quantify what exactly the services are that the oysters provide. And from there, management can set objectives for these services, such as um, reducing nitrogen uh, loads by X amount or improving um, black sea bass or other species, individual fish species, um, abundances and, and overall biomass by an X amount. Um, and once you establish your objective, you can uh, plug it into the calculator um, and it will essentially tell you either how much area of oyster reef needs to be restored or how many oysters or what the biomass needs to be to meet your restoration objective. Um, and we think that this will be a very valuable uh, tool for scaling up the restoration practices in the future. And to learn more about it and also uh, use this oyster calculator, you can visit oceanwealth.org uh, slash tools slash oyster dash calculator um, to get more information. And with that, that com uh, concludes our webinar. Um, I'd like to, you know, acknowledge some of our partners, but there's many other folks, you know, staff from all of these agencies um, and other partners that have contributed to these. And so we appreciate um, you know, their help and assistance, and I won't go through naming all of them because, you know, we're bound to forget someone. I'll flash up here um, just some of the literature that was cited in the presentation. Um, you can always pause it and go back if you want to grab a specific citation. And then just remind everyone that today's webinar was brought to you by the Rhode Island Shellfish Initiative. Um, so we hope that you you know, check in periodically, try to keep tabs on what the Shellfish Initiative is up to and opportunities um, for you to either engage or participate. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Thank you.